I hope that everyone is well rested. Um, there's not too much drama in your life. And if that you're not doing okay today, I hope whatever it is that's kind of driving you sideways just settles a little bit. Maybe take advantage of being around people. Um, life can come at you in some interesting ways at time as well. So I know there's a lot of different dynamics in the room. So um, it's not data governance, Matt, it's digital governance. Data governance is, I interact with those people a lot, and they're an interesting group of people. Um, and usually down the, the IT hole, and I'm sure you guys have some interaction with them that's quite fascinating, um, but that's not my area of expertise. But anyhow, today, what I really wanna talk about is collaboration. When I was asked to do this talk, and I appreciated sort of being invited into your community from the outside world, um, I really went to research, like, okay, what are all the digital asset management issues that are happening right now? Like, not top of mind, not thinking about it all the time. I'm a management consultant. I'm thinking about organizational structure and design. But I know, as you'll see as I talk a little bit about my experience, I know a lot about this area. And I was shocked, shocked to discover that it's kind of the same. <laughs> it's like the same old pile of stuff that people haven't been able to do. And so that made me feel a little bit good. So I really want to bring in at the start of this day today a lot of different ideas about collaboration and maybe provide some insight into why things haven't changed. Right? So there's a lot of frustration around whether or not, you know, how come we're still repeating the same things over and over again? Why am I telling the same story? Why does the digital industry on the whole seem to be just like looping and spiraling and getting bigger and worse and not better? And so I'm hoping to give some insights around that and also to give you some ideas of things that you can actually do right now. One of the things that I really like to instill in people is, or is to sort of empower folks to understand that they have agency. When you work in sign of a, a weird, obscure part of the digital platform, not the beautiful user interface UX people that are always like dancing beautiful dances with beautiful outfits and lovely glasses, right? Like you're not in that community. A lot of times it's really difficult to be seen and heard and a lot of times you think that there's not a lot of power that you have to affect change. And so that's not true. I think if anything, the types of skills that are represented in this room are the types of skills that we actually need. They're deep skills. They're not necessarily the sexiest thing to do, but they're very, very powerful when done well. And so I just wanted to say that to you and kind of thank you as a group of people. I actually, when I'm working on governance projects with people, appreciate interacting with people like you who are kind of in there making this machine work, right, in ways that people don't always appreciate. So that was my pat on the back to you, um, genuine. And I want to tell you a little about me because you don't know me that well, particularly well, probably most of you. There's some people I've known in for 25 years, it feels like, um, who are in the room and then people who don't know me at all. So I'm a little bit of a weirdo geek. So I'll be 60 next year. Unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. But when I was in university, I was a philosophy major. I started out a music major, but I ended up a philosophy major, and I wrote my university thesis on artificial intelligence, Ooh. on this book by Keith Gunderson called Mentality and Machines, which was all about the Turing test. In fact, my last name is Welchman. My ex-husband's grandfather was Gordon Welchman, who worked with Alan Turing at Bletchley Park. So. Yeah, not really related, but I'm in, I'm in England. I got to, this is, this is my street cred, man. My ex-husband I was only married to for three years, helped, his grandfather helped you win the war. Yeah. So like me. So there you are. So I did the, I wasn't the kind of beret wearing uh, cigarette smoking, although I did smoke cigarettes and drink a lot of coffee, existentialist philosophy major. I was the hard grinding symbolic logic philosophy major, right? Philosophy of language, a lot of symbolic logic. I went to grad school thinking I was going to be a professor. Uh, the only coding language that I know is prologue, which is based on symbolic logic. And so what that means is that I actually can really talk to developers. I didn't realize that at the time, but developers think in this if-then conditional world, and so they like me, and I get them, and I understand what it is that they're trying to do. So I, I learned prologue when I was in grad school, and then I decided not to become a philosophy professor um, when I was in grad school, but I did interact with the internet in the mid 80s because my boyfriend lived far away and I was in New York and he was 
wanted to stay in touch via email. So we used Pine. Does anybody know Pine? Okay, old people, thank you very much. <laughs> so that was my first interaction with the internet. This was pre-World Wide Web, right? And then after I decided not to be a philosophy professor, I had a Mac, like the first Mac. The, 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 you remember that with the one disk drive in the front. And so I got really connected with HyperCard. So this is my first interaction with hypertext. I created a database of all of the arias that I knew how to sing, because I had been soprano. And when you press the up button, it played the notes of the one that you were going to. And when you played that, like, this is what I was doing, right? So um, clearly, I lost my mind. It's your 20s. You do things, right? So I interacted with HyperCard. And then after that all blew up and I got out in the world, I started actually working directly with technology. And my first bout was with, what is this? Lotus Notes. Lo, does it say? It says right there. Anyhow, it was Lotus Notes. I worked for Citicorp, Citibank at the time. And I got there and I asked them a question, which was, can you tell me who everyone who works here and who they report to? And they were like, no. I was like, why would that, like logical Lisa, coming out of the world of symbolic logic, I'm like, okay, you're a giant global multinational corporation, and you can't tell me who reports to who? Like it was some kind of weird paper chain. So I started to create Lotus Notes around that problem, solving that problem. Um, then the web came around, right? And I got pregnant, had a child, and was bored. And a friend of mine gave me an HTML book and said, if you move to California, you can start coding pages for this company called Netscape. And so I did. And then I got divorced, and I needed a real job. So I took the first job I could get, which was in Cisco Systems. So this was landing very, very nicely in that Cisco Systems in the mid-90s, 96, 1996, already had multi-channel content publishing. So from one single source of the truth, one single source of assets. They were publishing, burning to CD-ROM. They were putting the book that goes in the box that goes, in, goes with the technology, it's how early it was. And they were also publishing all of their data sets, white papers, diagrams, et cetera, onto the intranet so that their sales team could use it. My job was to take that stuff and convert it to the look and feel of the external web, which was in 13 different languages. So they had multi-channel content delivery, and they had almost omni-channel, right? Because this woman, Jan Johnston Tyler, who doesn't do this work anymore, she won an award at the Smithsonian, was a librarian. And so her approach to doing this work was very, very holistic. So I was really fortunate in that the first real job I had was one on one of the biggest websites in the world at the company that kind of invented e-commerce at a time when there were no rules. So I was doing usability studies, I was doing metadata and taxonomy development, I would help to design some of the earliest content management systems that exist in Silicon Valley. So I was getting to advise um, interwoven team site, which is what ended up being purchased at, at Cisco Systems. So I got this really rich, deep, broad, and open education on what does it mean to run a big, giant, freaking website, right? And in multiple languages. But I got it in the early 90s. So, um, my job was to do this, convert this into the external look and feel. And I, like, on the second day, wrote a macro. Because I was like, this is like freaking monkey work. Like, this is not, you know, this is where the coding came along. And then actually started to define, a, define and develop a CMS that would help to do that. So that's kind of like where I cut my teeth. So I quit in 1999 thinking, okay, you know, I was aware that governance problems who makes things that there was fighting between marketing and IT over the ownership of the technology base, over what got done. All these problems that you see now that you're still dealing with, I saw them. I saw them really early. But where I was naive is that I believed that, you know, maximum 10 years and we'd figure it out. <laughs> right? I did. I really, well, because, you know, don't you know how to solve the problem? I mean, Right? I mean, is it really about not knowing how to solve the problem? No. Right? So you, if somebody gave you just carte blanche, the right team and the right resources, any digital asset management problem that you have, who couldn't solve it? Who doesn't know how to solve it, really? Well, you don't want to show your hand. But most of us, that's not the problem. 
It's not not knowing there are these other things. So I was naive and I thought, oh, you know, we can just go in and I can start my own consulting firm. And I did, thinking it was going to be easy to do. But um, it turned out that most of the problems around the change were human factors and organizational dynamics. So I went from consulting around large scale content management systems to governance, which for me is around the decision making that people make. The problem often is that people inside of the organization have really no understanding or no clear sense of how they ought to collaborate to achieve these shared goals. You have political factions inside of an organization that are fighting back and forth with each other. Um, a lot of, sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's around someone's career path. It's very seldom about actually getting the work done. And so that's kind of normal, unfortunately. Um, I discovered, so I started to center my consulting practice around governance. Can I help organizations figure out what they want to do and the roles and responsibilities around doing that with a deep sense of clarity? Not just, oh, we want to redesign this or we want to put all of our assets here, but what does that really mean for how the organization must work together? Who gets a little bit more empowerment and who's going to be disempowered? Whose job is going to shift? These are the types of dynamics that actually keep you from being able to do things, right? And so I've really focused a lot on that. Um, so you know, it's 25 years later, and we have the same challenges, but things are even more difficult to shift now because it's scaled. So I, I'm not going to give you a deep and rich talk about digital governance. Corner me anytime. Read my book. Happy to talk about it. But I do want to talk about how you come about governing, and then I want to tell you a story about how this works and why you aren't where you want to be. So you've got this innovation that happens at the very beginning. This innovation could be the World Wide Web. It could be the internet. It could be um, a channel. It could be a mobile channel. It could be the website channel. It could be email, man. it could be anything. You could be, be chat GPT and machine learning right now. You have something new that's coming into place. And there's this period of time where you've got this organic growth. You, don't, you know what it is. You're excited about it, but it's not you don't quite know what to do with it, right? So you just do a bunch of different stuff with it. It's probably happening. You see it in orgs now with this machine learning and chat GPT. Everybody's jumping on it. They don't actually know what they're doing or why they're doing. This is a necessary thing. This just happens. It's happening. There's nothing wrong with it. And there, there's this organic growth. So there might be two or three people in your org who are doing the same thing, right, in slightly different ways. There's a certain inflection point inside of the organization, preferably before you tar start to replicate and scale, where you kind of come into alignment and say, OK, we've played around with this. This is what we're going to try and do with this technology. Most, unfortunately, people don't do that. They kind of build their little fiefdom around their version of things, their version of assets, my particular set of things, and then they grow it out. And this is how you fall into this chaos pit. right? You get into, you get into that chaotic pit. Um, and then you have to climb out of it with governance, which is just some exercises and having conversations about what are we trying to do? What do we need to turn down? What do we need to turn up? Who needs to drop managing these assets? Who, where, to, like how? Like this very specific conversation so that when you scale, you can get up to this level of commodity. And commodity means boring and ready to be disrupted. We're, 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 you know, that's what happens. That's the cycle, right? You normalize things. They're fun and exciting. They go a little bit crazy. They fall into a chaos pit. You're like, OK, we need to freaking get organized. You get organized around it. You scale it up. And then it's sitting right there, ready to get knocked off its peak by the next technology or the next innovation. Organizations that can go from commodity to innovation and cycle through that are long-lived organizations. And they're rare. Right To keep that going, there's a certain R&D development that has to happen on that end there. So this is kind of the cycle that's going on. And what's really interesting about this is depending on what technology you're talking about or what you're trying to do, you can be in different places. So you might be in a really chaotic pit with websites and, you know, or even within the asset management domain. Some things might be really well managed, right? And other things not. So that makes it even more difficult to manage because everything's not in the same place at the same time. Or maybe assets associated with your website are used really well, but they didn't really get attached to mobile. Or like, so it's just like, there's just all this complexity that goes on. And so 
that makes it really hard. But the thing that I want to point out to you, or one other thing I want to point out to you, just as a seed for thought, I don't know why, but I just do. Whatever you install here, right? Whatever you install here will scale as you scale, right? So one of the things that I talk about to people is when I want them to govern, when I want you to say we're talking about governing against harm, we're governing for safety is a more positive way to say it. If you don't address safety here, if you don't address you know, online social media bullying here or anything like that, as it scales, the harm will scale. Right, so you have you see that in assets. Like if you don't if you don't address the proliferation of a of a content type or an asset, it just so understanding that where that inflection point is exactly when is it really important to stop that is is important on a number of different fronts, not just around asset management, but particularly around harm. I talk a lot about harm and safety. If there's harm in the innovation, if there's harm in the business model, like there was harm in what was going on at Facebook. Right, and then not intentional. I'm, I don't think anyone intentionally stall, installed harm, but there was harm in that model. And as it modeled and scaled, it just got bigger. Right, so you have to really be careful. So I'm just throwing that out there because I like to do that. So I want you to be able to try and address things more upstream than downstream. It's also easier. You, you don't have to take things away from people. If you let people manage all their assets by themselves for 15 years and then you take it away from them, they're going to go kicking and screaming. Right? If they never had the expectation that they were allowed to do that in the first place, then they just go with the flow. Right? So, um, I mean, nobody sits around saying, I want to make my own logo for my business. Well, because they know, maybe they do. I'm thinking about clients, and I'm like going, eh, never mind. <laughs> never, but you know what I'm talking about. That's as close as we're going to get to control. Right? So, um, so the question here now is, for your digital team, I'm, I'm looking at my time. Yes. How do we innovate, create, and scale with shared norms, goals, and values? Like, how do we get these, get these things together? So I'm going to tell you outright, it's very easy. We do it with intention and an understanding of where we are in the digital life cycle, right? both globally and for your organization. So that means how mature is the World Wide Web? How mature is the internet? How mature is your organization in the way that it uses digital capacity? Do you know the answer to that question? probably not thoroughly enough, and then with an understanding of who you are and what you can do. So I'm going to tell you a little story just to help you make you feel better. Everyone thinks we're in the 97th generation of the web, and we're not. Like, we're barely out of the first, right? So I want to tell you a story about um, uh, Mary Ward. She was an Irish nat um, naturalist, and um, her story is around how long it takes for people to get things right. So if you're frustrated because you've done your job forever and you can't figure out why it's right, hopefully you'll be less stressed. Why things aren't right, you'll be less frustrated with it now. So Mary is the first automobile fatality. Anyone know her story? OK, Irish nat um, naturalist. She was in a steam-powered vehicle. I think that her cousin was driving. They went around a curve. She was thrown from the vehicle. I'm sorry if this is triggering for anybody who may have lost someone in an auto accident. I don't mean to do that. She was thrown from the car and broke her neck and died instantly, right? And so you would think, and this was in, I'm looking at my notes, 1869. So this is even before the first gas-powered gas car. So you would think that immediately people would go, oh my god, these horseless carriages. We ought to do safe things for them, et cetera, et cetera. But if you actually look and see what happens with this, there's a lot of different ways to control things. One is by innovating and creating things to make it more safe. One of them is to then make these innovations standardized. And then the other one is to just put policy around it. Right? So if you look at this, 1869, she's had this tragic accident. There's all these people who are like, OK, here's the first gasoline-powered gasoline car. Not that that's a safety innovation. 1903, shatterproof grass. Traffic control systems, 1910. Barrier crash, 1930. Soft interiors, 1930s. Crumple zones, three-point seatbelts invented by Mills, I can't remember his last name, in Volvo, donated it, donated the three-point seatbelt so that everybody could use it, airbags. But what you see is this lag. The first thing that happened was shatterproof glass, honestly, because people were tired of seeing folks being decapitated. Right? But sensible things like wear your seatbelt, 1968. Right? And then the, the legislation behind this went late. So my point and around all of this 
is that it takes time. Human beings will run crazy on a technology, even with the loss of life for a long time. And I would venture if you look into any technology, radio, television, there's an element of harm and even loss of life at the very beginning of the innovation curve. So that is where we are right now. We have scaled enough that we can really see the harm in the web. We can really see the waste of not centralizing or controlling or managing digital assets. We can see it now, right? So the question is now what are we gonna do, right? So it's still relatively early. So while it may seem really self-evident to you that, oh, we should be able to fix this or whatever, it just takes people time to rally, and it's an ever-moving process. So now we've got, this is uh, Jason Brown, I think is his last name. Yes, no, Joshua Brown. Joshua Brown, first Tesla fatality. Um, now we're talking about autonomous driving, right? And that revamps the conversation, and I saw this on the BBC last year or earlier this year. They're finally creating an anthropomorphic test device, a crash test dummy that actually has for a woman's body. Finally, this year. They decided, oh, you know, oh my God, m more women are getting injured in automobile accidents. Maybe we ought to test it with a different shaped body, shorter or whatever the case may be. So this is a continuing process. So don't give up. Like, you know, I mean, like literally. Well, I mean, here's the power of it. You know, there are things that you can do right now, right? This is the beauty of it. There's actually stuff that you can do. And the point isn't to go, oh my God. I mean, we tend to measure things within the span of our professional career. And you need to detach from that. You are part of a long process of this technology maturing in the organization that you work in and globally, right? So you need to sow good seeds now, right? You may water them or whatever. You may not see the plant come, but sowing good seeds makes a huge difference. If nobody had invented a three-point seatbelt, if nobody had done any of these safety innovations, they couldn't have been brought into play later on. And so there's a selflessness that comes along with that. But just, I just want to talk about some tactical things that maybe you can do to understand how you can work. So the question is, I'll back up a little, who are you inside of an organization if you're trying to actually improve how you work and collaborate together and how important it is to actually do good work? If you're an executive and backer, you actually have strategic control of what gets built. Probably not an incredible amount of those people in here, the one who says yes to big projects or no to big projects. There are innovators and makers, probably a lot in this room, people who architect and build the experience. And by architect, I mean not just the UX top layer, but the guts. Like, I love the guts people. Because that's actually where it's at, right? Yes, icing on the cake, beautiful candles are a lovely thing. And, but single sign-on is sexier, right? So there you <laughs> Right, I mean like, come on, all the stuff that makes you go, oh, that was a good experience, usually isn't colors and stuff. It might be content, good content helps, but it really is how richly they've thought about how integrated this experience is and how they're passing your information seamlessly around in healthy and not creepy kinds of ways. And that's guts, right? So I'm all about this, people. Um, rule makers, yeah, who are writing product development rules, protocols, standards, and policies and then facilitators who are creating alignment. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these and just tactically give some, and some of you might wear multiple hats, right, around this. So see if you can identify yourself on this. I bet you a lot of you wear multiple hats in this, in this, in this pack. Probably a lot of people are two, three, and four, right, or at least two and three and pretend to do four. It's not really your job, but there's nobody else there to do it kind of stuff, right? Like, right? So there's like this variety of pack of stuff that's going on. So if you happen to be a technology executive or a financial backer, please come to me and give me your money. Um, but I think these are the people that have to take ownership for the risk, waste, and harm associated with the products and services. So internal risk and waste around asset management or anything else, du duplicative work and things like that. And then they also just have to wake up and understand that innovation doesn't have to mean willful ignorance. There's a, there's a dynamic in the maker community or in the innovative commu community of backers, which is less like, oh, we just go out crazy train, you know, and like let the cards fall where they may. Well, that doesn't work well with a World Wide Web, right? So I don't believe that innovation has to mean you just get to do whatever you want and forget about the consequences, right? I don't believe that. 
Um, you might, but anyhow. So you have to honor, innovators and makers have to honor the truth that product DNA and team collaboration norms happen early. That's what I was talking about. When you're in that innovation thing, not only, right, not only are you designing the thing, you are also designing the team that makes the thing. And I think that if there are any design-focused people in the room, even if you don't do that for a living, but you're thinking about that, Think about, I hate to use industrial factory models, but if you think about assembly lines and the, like the Model T or something like that, they're intertwined. That vehicle and the way that vehicle made, was made were married together. We don't do that in digital spaces. What we do is we design the digital thing and then we drag the freaking team on the ground behind it. Like if you have to like contort yourself to get that experience going. It's very, very unkind, right? I mean, like you've got these people at the mercy of this online experience. And so what I'm constantly trying to push more recently to designers is, yes, you have UXed me a wonderful, lovely experience. How is that actually gonna happen, right? Which includes digital asset management, right? Like, how, is the, how are people going to make that? And can we design the team so that it is married to that instead of taking this siloed frickin' team that's got a org structure that's still related to when I started in the industry, and then drag it behind this unified omni-channel experience. It's, it's insane, right? And so it makes me a little crazy. I get hot over that one. Um, rule makers, governance people, shouldn't be afraid to establish rules. I don't know why people think rules are like wacko. But I'm telling you, name me something that exists that we like, that is good, that scales, that doesn't have standards. Like this is just how the world works. People, right? I mean, there's just every technology, the reason why it's scaled, the World Wide Web that we worked with, like it's all standards-based. The reason why the web pops so fast is because Tim Berners-Lee had developed the W3C. He said, here's the standards. Everybody use them, it scales. Somehow I think the there's a little thing that popped in out of order. But anyhow, and the internet, it's all based on that. So I feel like we need to normalize and stop demonizing rules. It's okay to work by rules. In fact, you're gonna get something good and intentional if you rules. What, what happens is, is that people, there's a little extra one. I couldn't get that in order. I was doing really well, but then, then, then PowerPoint got the better of me. And I was like, I just literally gave up. I don't, like, I don't know how to get this snowflake to come in in order, but um, I didn't do it. So this is my wheelhouse. I want you to have an intentional, and I know you're into this, because if you're talking about digital asset management systems, you're also about rules, right? So establish mature governance practices that happen upstream and not downstream. So that's an art. If you put rules into place too fast and too early, that's problematic. Right, because you do actually stifle innovation. You can't govern something that doesn't exist. So you have to make it, and maybe it's gonna be a little bit harmful, but then you have to look at it early on and think about it. Think holistically about governance, including your assets, like not just the content, not just the technology, not just the data, but very holistically about it. Um, and make sure that you get that done. I could go on for days about how to do that because I've written a book. So. Um, happy to talk about that in a halls. So I'll be here both of the days. If you are a facilitator and a bridge, right, you need to understand the interconnectivity. Now this, when I first started out doing a technology work, we had these things called business analysts and project managers. And business analysts and project managers still sort of exist, but not really. They've kind of been replaced by like very product focused things like scrum masters. And so a lot of the analysis or understanding of the the implications of the work got dropped, got very like delivery focused, right? So I'd like to see not those roles come back, but I'd like to, to understand and re-examine where we put that, whether or not it's an ethicist to understand the morality of the work you're doing, an efficiency person, I don't care. But we need to understand the interconnectivity and the relationships between these silos and ex expose those inefficiencies before they scale. Had people gone, you know what? We don't need 17 versions of pictures of the telephone floating around in random repositories. Like if somebody had just spotted that early and addressed it, 
we wouldn't be here. So um, there would be things to talk about. So we need somebody, and usually it's the person that's working across those silos to do those sorts of things. So to end, not really what, sure what my time is because we started a little bit, but I think I'm on time. So uh, as I said at the very beginning, the accountability of sort of putting ourselves on the hook for things, I'm very serious about. Um, there's a lot of people, maybe some of you are in this room, not looking at anybody in particular, all of you, um, who can a little bit be a little victim-y of like, I'm being done to, they won't do the work that I want them to do. I know how to solve the problem and they won't do it. You just need to put that down. Like it might be true, right? But you need to put it down and actually do some of the things that you can do. So work with intention, work where you are. You don't need another job. You might want to grow your career at some point, but wherever you are right now, there is actually work that you can do. And particularly if you focus on how much are you doing to actually perpetuate this, the bad situation at hand. This is tough. We all have jobs, we have mortgages, we have families, we have bills, we have things to play. And it's tough sometimes to understand how hard to push against something, how much you're gonna put yourself at risk professionally. But oftentimes that actually leads you into non-action. And so, I, I work usually at a, a pretty high level in the org and I see the teams and what I see from executives and people at the top of the organization is that they want folks to come with them with a good solution, right? They want people to push a little bit, but not in a kind of like complaining way, but really in a proactive way that's related to the business model. It shows how this makes sense. And some of you all have probably made those arguments as well. Um, but I just really wanna press on you, like keep at it, give yourself breaks when you need it. Right, but just really do the work where you are because it is noticed and it's really needed. And so I think that's all I have to say for this morning. I hope you guys are this. Um, I think you guys will get this, different ways that you can work with me. I give seminars, things like that. Read my book. Um, happy to uh, talk to you guys in the hall today. I really appreciate your time and attention. I hope I said something that was of remote interest to you, only one thing, it doesn't have to be every slide, but I hope I, I said something to you that, that resonated with you and um, in your life and ever always, I really wish you well. Thank you. Thank you.